The sermon for the 18th week after Pentecost is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. Uh, the sermon is entitled, Greatness in Humility. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Indeed, greatness in humility, that is a kind of an opposing title there in the sermon uh, as we rests upon what our Lord would do for the sins of the world. In our gospel text here in Mark chapter 9, he begins with his foretelling of what was to come in his death and resurrection. The Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Indeed, indeed, Jesus is laying out the blueprint of his state of humiliation. A radical foretelling this was as disciples did not understand what this true humiliation would truly entail for the Christ as he would endure and ultimately die for the sins of the world. And therefore, since they did not understand the height and the depth and the breadth of what this meant, well, they would go inward, of course. And they would ask, who was the greatest? Now, in society at the time, in the world that they lived in, as it is today, right, this question was a very important question that really defined who they were. And this was in, in society in that day and even today. It is this picture of greatness to which many would argue about then and even now. And even when the greatest was in their midst, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, who became the least for us, they still didn't see it. And there they persisted in that topic of status, of position, of pride, of reputation. And yes, they were arguing in front of the humiliation who was the greatest. I mean, Jesus, of course, knew this, <laughs> but yet he still asked, well, what were you discussing, my disciples, on the way to Capernaum? And what did they say? Did they say, Yes, we were describing who was the great. No, he... They kept silent. Now, when you keep silent, and when the children, you know, when, they're, when your parents ask you a question and you know <laughs> you're, not, you're probably not going to give them the answer they want to hear, you usually keep silent, don't you? And that's what the disciples did as well. They, they knew better. I mean, after all, Jesus foretold what he was going to do, and they assessed what they were arguing about, and, and they very well knew better to tell Jesus, well, you know, we were asking, you know, who was the greatest amongst ourselves. And today, in our tension of the text, we dwell upon true humility. You know, humility is being brought low, to be humbled. As Jesus, well, those, as he says in Scripture, as we see today in our epistle, that those who are humbled or those who are exalted will be humbled and vice versa. And, and here we very well know that the disciples needed that very thing. Indeed, the pride of man. You know, the thing about pride is that it wants nothing to do with humility. You know, pride hungers for greatness. Pride hungers for self-promotion, selfish ambition, the idolatry of one, one's own reputation. Pride wants to stand on its own two feet saying, I am great. But as it reads in our epistle text today, Selfish ambition, well, that will bring disorder. That this pride is actually unspiritual, is demonic. Have you ever thought of pride as a source 
of unspiritual as demonic. Have you seen it at that? I mean, we're so prideful in our own way that we fail even to see the spiritual ramifications of what that truly brings to the table, that you shall be like God. The devil says, and their pride says, yes, I want to be like God. See, this is the danger of pride. Because pride always gets in their own way. How important it is to look beyond ourselves, and thus this is what humility brings to the table. It shows us what is beyond ourselves and as we look in the mirror, and there is the Lord and His very Word. And you know, for the disciples, this is what they were being taught because they too were getting in their own way. Rather than looking beyond themselves, they looked to their very own self, to the source of their own pride, to which would be their disease, and they would ask the futile question, who is the greatest? And in this sea of debate, Self-exaltation was their motive, competing with one another in hopes of actually answering the question, who is the greatest amongst ourselves? Are we number one or are we number four? You know, Jesus knew their hearts and thus he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. This is the greatest. The last of all. Is that what the disciples were thinking when they were arguing who is the greatest? I want to be last. I want to be last in line. I want to be the lowest. That's the greatest. Is that what they were? No, they were saying number one, number one, number one, glory, pride, myself. My status. Jockeying for position in hopes of being the greatest. Today in our text, Jesus turns everything upside down and shows them that greatness is in humility, true humility, and that is not of self. Because our sin loves to be great. And Jesus is showing us today, no, you're not so great at all in yourself. It's a sobering reality of our sin, the sin of pride. The sin of selfishness. I know the devil says it's no selfishness. Pride, that's your daily, that's your daily walk. It's no big deal. Just continue on. Fill your cup. Lead by your pride. Live by your own self-glory. Make, this, make these things define yourself. This is the temptation for all of us. The question is, do you see this in your life? You know, pride is, is like breathing, isn't it? We live in a world that is so pride. We, we all want to be number one, whether it is by our own humani- humanism, by our own manipulation, by playing that chess game, thinking that we can one-up our neighbor in hopes of being better than them, so puffed up by our reputation and our accolades that this becomes our one true God. This becomes our source of greatness. And what does Jesus do at this very moment? It is quite telling. Jesus puts a child in his arms. He is showing his disciples what it means to be the greatest. That is, Jesus is showing the disciples that not only were they entangled in their own selfish ambition, indulgent in their own way, but he also showed them that they failed to see the sacrificial life to which they were called to love and serve to those around them. The helpless ones. The little ones, the children, they needed help. They needed love. They needed service. They needed someone to care for them. And for Jesus, this was their teaching moment. 
reminding them what true greatness is. That is to help the helpless. That is to look beyond self. And pride doesn't do that, does it? Pride does not look beyond self. Pride starts with Yourself, number one, number two, number three. Everything is about self. And thus today, as we look at this text, we, we indeed are humbled. Aren't we? You know, Jesus says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Now, this is greatness. Do we do that perfectly? Are we always the last of all in all facets of our life? Please raise your hand if you are. <laughs> I don't think anyone could raise their hands in this question. But there is only one who can. He doesn't raise his hand but he goes upon that tree. This is true greatness. You know, it is the humility of Christ. You know, you might tell yourself, no, I, 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 can, I can be more humble. I, I can be more, you know, uh, show more humility. I, I will put away my pride. But when you look in the mirror, you very well know how easy it is, the pride that is before you. You know, when we look in the mirror, yes, we see our pride, and there immediately we can no longer look to self, but only look to Christ. You know, our Lord, this is humility. Taking upon this flesh, God all-powerful, one true God, sending His Son to take upon our lowly flesh. Think about that for a second before even getting to the cross. Our God loves us so much that He sent His Son in this lowly flesh to weep, to cry, to be betrayed, to be hungry, to dwell with us lowly sinners. The one who knew no sin but became sin for us. This is greatness. Yes, we can puff out our chest and say, look how great I am, but no. This is greatness. The one who was indeed brought low, and there he was even tempted by the devil, saying, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. There in the desert, 40 days, 40 nights, Jesus hungry, tired, and weary. And there the devil says, you can be the greatest if you bow down to me. I will give you all this in the world, and you will have it all. Be gone, Satan, Jesus said, for you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. This is the humiliation of Christ. It is the one who took the cup of wrath, your sins upon himself. Not only would he take it, but he would see the agony of the cross and go straight for that life-saving measure. There he would hang upon that tree in what seemed to be the defeat of our one true God by the betrayal of man. There he would give you victory. Yes, this was not an easy feat for Jesus. It was very painful, excruciating it was. Not only was he in great pain, but the world in their own greatness saying, look, we have him. We've defeated him. He is lost. Look at this, Jesus, who does he think he is? But there he was the greatest and he always shall be. Because Jesus takes a child that day and shows the disciples, this is what it means to be great to help the helpless, to help the broken. And that's what Jesus does. For there is no greater one than he. 
because you and I both need His help. We are broken. We are separated from God, and we need Him to reconcile us to our Father, and that is what He has done. And our Lord, in that greatness, even though He died, there He would say, it is finished. Again, the world thought maybe, finally, we have put Jesus down. But greatness, just as he foretold, would not be left down. No, he would rise from the dead to give you his victory. That by his greatness, in his humiliation, there he would be exalted because this is Jesus. Declaring you righteous, forgiven, redeemed, paid for the salvation one for each and every one of you. This is greatness and it is yours because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. All due to what he has done for each and every one of you. The servant of all, Jesus, is to be your redemption. To pay the price for your sins. You know, friends, as we are near the end of this sermon, I, I really want to tell you what you should not take from this sermon at the end of the day. What you should not take from this sermon is, that's right, I learned that I must be more humble, and I'll try my hardest to be more, to show humility in my life. Yes, that sounds like a, a, a good thought to take home. But yet it always begins and ends in Christ. But what you should rest upon is, in his humility, in his work, thanks be to God, I am forgiven. And I have the abundant life that he has freely given to me. And in his humiliation, I know what love is. And now I go forth knowing how to love, not for my own pride, not for my own legalism, not to prove something to God, no, because I am already there by the one who stood in my place. And what a joy it is to love and serve. All the opportunities in your vocation, all the, all the chances you have that God has presented to you to love and serve, what a joy it is to do. All because of what he has done for you. His humiliation. His exaltation. For there lies your forgiveness. It is Christ. Greatness in true humility. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please rise as you are able.